Joining us on our newsroom set is Lisa Rosenberg with the Sunlight Foundation, government affairs consultant, to give us a little bit more information about the Supreme Court's decision. Ms. Rosenberg, so let's begin with the history of these campaign finance laws. What did the court, uh, which law did the court consider, and what's its history? Well, the history of the laws um, is pretty straightforward. These laws have been in place since the Watergate era, since the 1970s. Um, and, you know, in fact, Watergate was basically a campaign finance scandal. And at that time, Congress thought that three pillars were necessary to address corruption and the appearance of corruption. Those pillars were um, spending limits, contribution limits, and disclosure. Uh, now, spending limits have been sort of being chipped away at really since the earliest days of, uh, the, dis of the campaign finance reform laws, since the 70s. And the sort of final nail in the coffin on spending li limits um, happened when the Supreme Court decided the Citizens United case just a few years ago. So that leaves us with contribution limits and disclosure. And yesterday's decision in McCutcheon um, really undid the contribution limits part of the campaign finance reform scheme um, by saying that the overall caps on what an individual can give to political candidates um, are unconstitutional. So they basically said that you can give millions of dollars, um, you know, during an election cycle to the candidates and the campaigns. We'll dig into that a little bit more. But how did this case come about? Well, the um, McCutcheon, the plaintiff, um, had been giving to individual candidates and reached the cap. Um, now there are limits on what you can give to individual candidates, and there are twenty-six hundred dollar limits. Uh, those are still in place. Um, but McCutcheon um, had reached the cap of what he could give overall, and uh, he decided that he wanted to give more and, you know, just challenged the constitutionality of the case. So now um, anybody, McCutcheon or anybody else, can give, again, as I said, just millions of dollars if they choose to. Who backed Sean McCutcheon's case? Um, well, it was, you know, it was primarily uh, right versus left sort of um, uh, division, as we also saw in the, in, you know, in the decision. Uh, so a number of, um, you know, folks on the right who have been opponents of campaign finance reform, um, you know, supported McCutcheon in his efforts. And the FEC, what was their role? Well, the FEC is supposed to enforce the current laws. Um, and so under the law prior to yesterday's decision, the FEC was supposed to enforce the campaign finance um, caps, the limits on what McCutcheon could give. So basically, they could fine him. They could, you know, do other things if he had um, if he had gone over the the, the limit. Let's talk ab ab about the plaintiffs, uh, McCutcheon, and the uh, Republican National Committee who mm -hmm. helped back him. Mm -hmm. This is what the chairman of the RNC had to say. In the Wall Street Journal, he was quoted as saying, what the campaign finance laws have done is put party committees in a place where we have the most restrictions, the most disclosure, and we can raise the least. What's happened is that the groups that can raise the most disclose the least. So he told, uh, this is what he had to say uh, about the court's decision and went on to say that this then now allows, allows the campaign committees to raise and they will then disclose who their donors are. Well, to a limited degree, that is true. Um, I would add that the reason that the groups that can raise the most disclose the least is also due to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court Citizens United decision saying that corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money in, in um, independent, so-called independent campaign expenditures. Um, and that was the Supreme Court, you know, changing the law just a few years ago. Um, so, so the Supreme Court really started us on this path, and that's true. That resulted in a lot of money being funneled to these 501c4 um, nonprofit organizations that you might have heard of um, that can spend unlimited amounts from corporations and individuals without disclosing it. The problem is that doesn't change. So corporations can still spend secret money in unlimited amounts, or individuals can remain anonymous um, and spend unlimited amounts if they choose to and go through the nonprofit regime. Or they can go directly through the parties and the candidates where there is disclosure, but um, I, you know, I would argue not enough disclosure. And in fact, we've off, we are supporting le legislation that um, would provide for even more enhanced disclosure. And we can talk about that later. But um, 
you know, nothing is fixed, nothing is changed. We're not going to see less money, and we're not going to see much more disclosure um, unless our, you know, our bill, the bill that we support, is, is enacted um, as a result of this decision. So do you believe that the so-called super PACs will now be less likely to raise as much money as they did in past elections? No, not necessarily, because, again, the super PACs can take corporate money. This um, decision applies to what an individual can give, basically, out of their own pocket. It does not apply, does not change um, the prohibition against corporate money is giving directly to candidates. So if corporations want this, they will give through super PACs or secret nonprofits. So this is just about the individual donor. Correct. What did the laws restrict before? Where were the caps? And what does this decision do to them? So the caps before, again, there, there's a $2,600 cap per, um, per candidate. That remains in place. But there were also these overall caps and it was around $40,000 um, that an individual could give to, to candidates overall and around $74,000 um, that an individual could give to parties. So, um, you know, so it was a, a roughly $120,000 cap that an individual could give overall to the parties and the candidates. That $120,000 cap is now gone. Um, and it's, it's, you've got to think of it as, you know, who can really give $120,000 or more because now we're talking – um, about individuals having the freedom to give millions of dollars. I mean, they can give more than most people earn in a year. Um, and and that's what's really um, disturbing to many of us about this decision. What do you think this means for the November 2014 election cycle and the 2016 election cycle? I mean, I think it means we're going to see a lot more money by just a handful of individuals. Um, we call them the 1% of the 1%. These are um, just the very few wealthy individuals, 600, 1,000 individuals that may take advantage of this decision and write, um, you know, million-dollar checks. And what else is disturbing, what I think we're going to see more of, is the candidates themselves, our elected officials, asking for million-dollar checks. You know, hat in hand, write me a check for $3 million. And they're going to know who's, who's generous and who's going to give them those checks, and they're going to know the interests of those individuals and what those people want to have happen in Congress. And do these congressional candidates, lawmakers on both sides benefit, both Democrats and Republicans? They do. Um, we have done some analysis that indicates that um, slightly more of the people who, who have maxed out previously under the earlier, under the limits that were just struck down, um, there are slightly more Republicans than Democrats that, that max out. Um, but certainly, you know, Parties, uh, both parties will will certainly ask for these large contributions, um, and you know we'll see whether they receive them. The other thing that can happen is if you're a donor and you want to hedge your bets, you can give millions of dollars to both parties and be sure that uh, you know your side is heard by everyone, whoever's in office. This is what the majority for the court had to say. Chief Justice John Roberts, writing the decision, said the right to participate in democracy through political contributions is protected by the First Amendment. But that right is not absolute. Congress may regulate campaign contributions to protect against corruption or the appearance of corruption. It may not, however, regulate contributions simply to reduce the amount of money in politics or to restrict the political participation of some in order to enhance the relative influence of others. Lisa Rosenberg, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's naive. Um, I think to if, if indeed contributions can be limited or restricted to prevent corruption or the appearance corruption, I'm not sure what appears more corrupt than a member of Congress or an elected official or a candidate asking for a $3 million check from one person. To me, that is the epitome of the appearance of corruption. And if Chief Justice Don, John Roberts doesn't see it that way, I think that is naive at best. Um, I think he's missing the point. Roberts, uh, you know, in other parts of the decision, went on to say that really the only sort of corruption he believes in or believes exists is what is called quid pro quo corruption. That is basically, I give you a million dollars in exchange for your vote. And that doesn't happen. That's not realistic, of course. Um, you know, we view corruption as the access and I give you a million dollars. You know, just listen to what I have to say. You know, take up my cause on the floor of the Senate or the House or don't take it up. Um, it's very hard to prove that there is, you know, a direct link between uh, the contribution and what's actually happened. 
but certainly if that's not corruption it is at the very least of the appearance of corruption but according to Roberts that's okay Lisa Rosenberg is government affairs consultant with Sunlight Foundation she's here to take your questions and comments about the court's decision yesterday we'll be with Stanley in Westboro Massachusetts independent caller hi Stanley thank you for putting me on it's not enough I, I, I don't even vote anymore because uh, there's there's double voting because they don't check ID. Thirty five thousand just came across the the news on this morning. I'm putting all my effort into making money cash so that the third problem with this country, the IRS doesn't get it. <laughs> so whatever they do it doesn't affect me. Good okay. luck, hey. <laughs> okay, Stanley. Uh, this on Twitter from one of our viewers who says, why Congress is allowed to be bribed? Can we bribe judges, police, teachers now too? And this also, uh, Hope Third World is watching our Supreme Court want a democracy, write a law by a congressperson. We're getting your thoughts, your comments this morning. Don in Greenville, Ohio, independent caller. Hi, Don. What do you make of the Supreme Court's decision yesterday? I think it's terrible, and I'll, I'll give you some more information that I think is wrong. I think that's leading to more corruption in this government than we already have, and we've got more than we can handle now. And I think, really, we need a third party and to stop all this called We the People of the United States. And these Supreme Court judges are just wrong when they go ahead, and they was wrong on uh uh, uh, Obama care. I think they was wrong on that too, to a certain extent. And uh, it's it's just playing out of hand. That's why we need a third party called We the People of the United States. I thank you very much. Okay. All right, Carol in Ohio, Democratic caller. Hi, Carol. We can go out as voters and vote against them. There's more of us than there is of them. So we can get out and vote against this uh, because of the candidates doing this. And we can vote against these candidates, especially the Republicans. And that's the only thing we have left is to go out and vote against them. Okay. All right, Carol. Lisa Rosenberg, let's take Carol's point. Well, I think, you know, Carol's absolutely right. Um, my concern is that voters, you know, we already have extremely low voter turnout in this country. Um, and I think that's due in part to, to cynicism about the process. And I think that the possibility of these massive contributions coming in from just a few people is going to make people even more cynical, cynical and less likely to vote. Of course, I hope that's not the case, but I'm, I'm very concerned that that is the case. And I also think, um, you know, that, that small donors, donors who want to give their support with a $25 contribution or a $50 contribution to a candidate are going to say, why bother? Um, it's dwarfed by these million dollar contributions. Why should I bother contributing at all? Um, so I think it's going to actually depress participation um, by, by people who can't afford to write the large checks. Um, so we should vote, and the caller's absolutely right about that. Um, but the whole system has been corrupted by the money that is, is just going to be flowing into these elections. What do you make of these numbers in the Wall Street Journal this morning? They report that in the 2012 election, an estimated 644 individuals donated the maximum amount allowed by law to candidates and political parties, with about 60 percent of the money going to Republican causes. Their 93.4 million in contributions were a tiny fraction of the overall amount of money spent on elections. Roughly 1.2 million Americans made donations of $200 or more in the 2012 election. In all, those donations accounted for $2.8 billion, or 64 percent of the amount of money spent on the 2012 election. This is according to the Center for Responsive Politics. I think that one of the key numbers in that story is, I think you said it was 644 um, individuals who maxed out, and those are the people that we were talking about earlier. Those are the folks that, that, that um, gave the you know, $123,000 or so. Those people have every incentive now to give more, and they have the, the means to give more. Um, and I am very concerned about a democracy where 644 people have the ear of my members of Congress, um, where 644 people can go to John Boehner and say, you know, look, I'll write a million-dollar check or a $2 million check to your to your party and to, um, to your members, 
Um, but I really don't want to see, you know, whatever tax issue, Obamacare, whatever it is, come to the floor of the House. Um, I think that's a really dangerous way to, to run our democracy. Um, and I think, you know, the First Amendment argument should cut both ways. I think that these massive checks are drowning out the my voice as a small donor. If I wanted to give $25 or $100 or even $200, um, you know, that is, that is, that's nothing. No one's going to pay attention to that. No one's going to notice that because it's basically just, um, dwarfed by these massive contributions. So that's what concerns me about those numbers. Well, speaking of the First Amendment, Justice Scalia wrote uh, that if the First Amendment protects egg burning, funeral protests, and Nazi parades, despite the profound offense such spectacles cause, it surely protects political campaign speech despite popular opposition. And political campaign speech was alive and well before the McCutcheon case yesterday. Again, I think that's what's so naive about the majority's decision. Um, you know, McCut Sean McCutcheon and everyone else was able to give, again, $123,000, more than most people earn in a year, um, you know, during, to, during an election cycle. Uh, there was no chilling of political speech before yesterday. If McCutcheon wanted to give money to every single candidate, he could have given money to every single candidate in the Republican Party, um, just not the maximum amount, which is which is the only difference. So we're just we're talking about um, it, it, what's being ignored by the majority is the political speech of the rest of us, and the you know 99.9 percent of us don't have the means or the ability to make these large contributions. Well, what about our speech? And that's what is just um, ignored by the majority of the court. Carol Olds tweets in, both parties know how to play the game and play they do. Obama has raised more money than anybody. There is always way a way to get money. Kelvin in Portland, Oregon, independent caller. What do you think, Kelvin? Well, first of all, I enjoy the show, and this subject is very interesting. Thanks for taking the call. Um, I have two questions, um, then a statement. First, how, can you translate it in layman's terms? What does this mean um, for state, county, city, state, local elections, or is it just does it just impact congress congressional and Senate races? And then my second uh, uh, question is: Does 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 this 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 sea change in 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 capping campaigns or removing the cap have have to do with the fact that we have an African American man in the White House and and hopefully we'll have a a woman and Hillary Clinton be our next president. Race and gender specific. Thank you very much. Well, Kelvin, what do you mean, what do you mean by that? Race and gender specific. Well, I, I, here, here in the state of Oregon, um, we have a, a number of women in, in wonderful leadership positions, and uh, there's a good old boy club that exists, and so they, they, they create these uh, uh, systematic race and systems to uh, uh, create manufactured allegations and in, uh, unjust uh, uh, assaults against uh, women and people of color in positions. And so to, my question mean specifically is that uh, are these folks, uh, good old boys, worried that we're going to have a woman president uh, after uh, uh, Obama. I see. Lisa Rosenberg. Uh, well, addressing that question first, I would just say that I think that this Supreme Court would be hostile to any campaign finance restrictions or limitations, no matter who was in office. Um, I think that they truly believe that, you know, more money in politics is better. And, um, you know, I don't think it has to do with race or or gender, uh, it might have to do more with wealth. I think that they really are interested in letting the wealth speak uh, as loud, the wealthy speak as loudly as they wish. So, um, so I do think that this court would have really been hostile to, uh, to, these, to these reforms, no matter who was in office. Now, getting to your first question, this does impact uh, state and local elections as well, um, because any caps now are illegal. So if a state wanted to cap campaign contributions in, you know, in its, its elections, they can't do that. Carl's up next. Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, Republican caller. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned Richard Nixon, but you failed to mention Obama uh, using the IRS to go after his political opponents. Now, if you're going to be fair, you're going to have to mention both because Obama has to around this because he can seek the IRS on people that that donate a lot of money, and he has he did that 
right before the last election. Okay, Carl, we'll have Lisa Rosenberg weigh in on that. Um, you know, I would uh, and have argued a couple things. First of all, the IRS was focusing on um, conservative as well as left-leaning donors in their investigation. I think the IRS, the way the IRS went about their investigation, and this was into these nonprofit organizations that were engaging in um, election activities. And I think, you know, the IRS um, actually should investigate nonprofits that are engaging in electioneering activities because nonprofits, tax exempt organizations, organizations that get a benefit from the government, um, should not be engaging in electoral policy, politics. That's, that's written in the law. Uh, so the IRS was right to, to investigate it. They went after certain groups in a very clumsy and inappropriate way. There's no question. Um, but certainly there's been no, you know, evidence of conspiracies or, or uh, you know, proof that the Obama administration directed this. So um, I think, you know, and I support efforts that would rein in these nonprofits because this is a dangerous, um, you know, impact of the Citizens United case that, that millions of dollars in corporate money, you know, un unlimited money can go secretly through nonprofits to affect our elections. So uh, I disagree with the caller, um, and I think that we need to to attack to address that issue as well. Um, so now there's really two issues that we need to focus on: the the direct contributions from individuals because of McCutcheon's, and the um, unlimited dark money contributions that are a result of the Citizens United case. What about this point from Denny Brown on Twitter, who says this: It is not bribery if you are fully disclosing your back. And should focus on being an informed voter. Well, actually, I'm glad that he raises that because we um, are championing a bill that was introduced yesterday by uh, Senator King from Maine, and it should be introduced later this week by Congressman O'Rourke in the House. We are champ championing a bill that would require disclosure of these donations, if they're $1,000 or more, within 48 hours. Um, right now, we do not have that system. Right now, we have a system where we, as voters, have to wait um, often as much as three months after a contribution is given to find out who is donating to a candidate. Um, and we think with these, you know, million dollar contributions potentially coming in, we want to know right away. So I agree um, with the comment that, you know, you need to be an informed uh, voter. There's no question about that. Unfortunately, right now we do not have the laws to provide uh, or ensure that voters are informed, and so we hope that'll change. A couple emails from our viewers from Paul. He says this, the media fails to report that those justices that allow big money donors to ruin democratic voting practices are all Republican appointments. The recent blocking of President Obama's appointments to the appeals court is self-explanatory now. Is it any really any wonder why the country is living in ignorance? And then another email from Greg in Sioux Falls who says, term limits for judges, only the federal level has lifetime appointments, and look how they have taken common sense out of everyday life. We're getting your thoughts, your take this morning on the Supreme Court's 5-4 to four decision yesterday in lifting campaign caps for individuals. Sal in Rochester, New York, Democratic caller. You're on the air. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. I really enjoy your show. And I think it was a terrible decision. Um, I'm, I'm tired of these guys buying their way in um, because you got guys like Sheldon Addison who, who wants to uh, put up billions of dollars now because he's got an agenda of taking uh, uh, online betting you know, away. And the second comment I just want to make real quick, I'm so sick and tired of turning my TV on and hearing all these Republicans come out and say all they talk about is repealing Obamacare. They need to realize it's here to stay. Instead of coming up with a solution to fix some of the problems, that's their whole goal is to repeal Obamacare. So anything the Democrats put in the, in the Senate or a bill they put in, they, uh, they all want to go against it. Any, anything the, the, the uh, Democrats want, the Republicans want to, to, to they not go with it because they didn't get their way. It's about time the American people wake up and go out and vote and get some of these people out of there. Thank you. Here's, here's the reaction from Capitol Hill yesterday from a couple lawmakers. The Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, Democrat of Nevada, tweeted this out. Citizens United was one of the worst decisions in the history of the court. Today's ruling further drowns the voices of working Americans. And then the minority leader for the Republicans in the House, Mitch McConnell, put out a statement saying that the First Amendment rights of the Constitution for Americans is being protected by the court's decision. Mary, uh, excuse me, here's Nancy Pelosi's, her tweet. 
on the SCOTUS decision, saying SCOTUS has chosen to pour even more money into our process and politics. We must restore fairness and pass the By the People Act. Senator Ted Cruz, Republican of Texas, says our democracy works better when the free speech rights of the citizenry are unfettered. Those are some of the some of the reaction from Capitol Hill yesterday, the Supreme Court's decision. Mary in Magnolia Springs, Alabama, independent caller. Mary, what's your take? Yes, uh, and by the way, to Mr. Oregon, I used to be, I was a lifelong Democrat until 2008 when I was supporting Hillary Clinton, and I was called a racist, and so were the Clintons. And now all of a sudden, all the Democrats love Mrs. Clinton. Well, guess what? I'm an independent. Thank you for uh, removing me from my party of long standing. You know, to try to remedy the problem. Democrats still take the money. Yes, no question. Linda in Stanley, New York, Republican caller. Hi, Linda. Hi. Uh, gee, some of these other people stole my thunder. The unions. You have Tom Steyer that's going to give a million, a hundred million dollars to campaigns, and I wish somebody would look into his background because I think he's invested in the Farallon Corporation, which will build the pipeline to the west coast of canada so people need to check that one out and you've got these unions millions and millions of dollars our president sells access to the white house for five hundred thousand dollars a pop that goes to campaigns come on ladies shine some sunlight on this stuff lisa rosenberg you know, we want to shine sunlight on all of these contributions, and that is exactly why we have advocated in favor of the Disclosed Act, which would shine light on this, this dark money, this corporate and union money that is um, paying for campaign ads, um, you know, that we, we saw $300 million in the last election cycle of um, coming in, you know, that we could, that we could name, and there was probably a lot more than that. Um, and we want to shine a light again. We want to know every contribution over $1,000 that comes in to Democrats or Republicans, to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. We want to know about that within 48 hours. There's no question that we want disclosure of all of that information, and we don't care, uh, you know, which direction it's coming from. USA Today opinion page this morning. Their view is that justices open spigots even wider for big money donors. The opposing view this morning, written by James Bopp, who served as lead counsel for the Republican National Committee in McCutcheon versus the FCC, he writes this, a victory for liberty and democracy. McCutcheon also empowers political parties, vital to the stability of our democracy. Political parties' influence has declined recently compared with super PACs, Super PACs typically are more polarizing because they represent narrow viewpoints, while political parties are more broad-based and so temper polarization. Lisa Rosenberg, what do you make of that argument? Um, you know, that remains to be seen. I think that what we might end up seeing is more polarized parties, again, because the donors who are motivated to give these massive amounts of money, again, on either side, left or right, may be... Um, you know, more partisan than uh, than the average donor. Um, you know, they may have you know beliefs that are that are just sort of well, again more partisan, stronger, uh, more, more polarizing than the average donor. So, will the parties respond to that in exchange for you know multi-million dollar checks? I think they might. So, I think we might just see the polarization becoming more entrenched in the party process. Uh, you know, we'll see. But again, you know, even if that doesn't happen. Um, I think we need to be concerned about the corruption to our democratic process. I think it is very, very dangerous for the, you know, the, the members in power to have, um, to, you know, to rely on, to really need these large contributions, these massive contributions. You know, and of course, they're going to be listening to the donors' interests. And I think that is a corrupting influence of this money that cannot be ignored. Living No Limits tweets in, it's the need for full, full disclosure that is missing in our elections. That is harming the process. Dark money should be outlawed. Also in the opinion pages this morning, Ann Ravel, who is the vice chairman of the Federal Election Commission, writes how not to enforce campaign laws. The Federal Election Commission is failing to enforce the nation's campaign. I'm in a position to know I'm the vice chairwoman of the commission. 
At my confirmation hearing last year, I promised to vigorously uphold those laws. I've been on the commission only six months. You have quickly learned how paralyzed the FEC has become and how the courts have turned a blind eye to this paralysis. The problem stems from three members who vote against pursuing investigations into potentially significant fundraising and spending violations. In effect, cases are being swept under the rug by the very agency charged with investigating them. Lisa Rosenberg, what's happening over at the FEC? Well, that's exactly right. Now, the FEC was designed to be ineffective. Uh, Congress designed it. It's supposed to enforce the campaign finance laws, but it has three Republican members and three Democratic members. And so you see gridlock um, or deadlock on the most important cases, the most challenging or divisive cases where, um, you know, three members will, will, will decide that they don't need to take an enforcement action so nothing happens. Um, and, and that's by design. That is Congress saying, you know, we don't want our campaign finance laws enforced. So, um, you know, the FEC is going to have a little bit less to enforce right now because now there, you know, there, there are fewer rules after yesterday's McCutcheon decision. Um, but the FEC is also charged with disclosing the money that's flowing into the political system. And again, that's where, you know, we hope to see more, um, you know, real-time disclosure of these large contributions. Um, and the FEC actually doesn't do a bad job with disclosing contributions. They do a terrible job with enforcing the laws. But, um, you know, they are a, a, a pretty competent disclosure agency. Now we just need the laws to be updated uh, so that the disclosure can happen uh, in a more comprehensive and faster way. From the editorial board pages, the New York Times says the court follows the money. The Supreme Court on Wednesday continued its crusade to knock down barriers to the distorting power of money on American elections. The Wall Street Journal says political speech wins again. The Supreme Court takes another step back from pernicious limits on campaign donations. Gwen in Detroit, Michigan, Democratic caller, what do you think, Gwen? Well, I think that um, the Republican Party has always found a way to cheat and lie and go around the back door. All of their commercials are just full of lies that they just uh, emulate. You know, I mean, they just flood people's um, TVs and calling them on the phone and things like that, you know, and the people just need to get out and vote and don't stop donating because if we don't donate, then we won't be able to have any um, commercials or campaign uh, commercials to counteract what they're saying. And um, thank goodness for MSNBC because that does put the spotlight on a lot of these things here. So we just can't give up. You know, okay. we still have to donate. All right, Gwen. Rich in Natrona Heights, Pennsylvania, independent caller. Hi, Rich. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my point is this. If, if uh, Chief Justice Roberts is, is, wants to put his money where his mouth is, then I say this. Pass this transparency law and make these caveats in the law. Number one, anything under $2,000, any candidate can vote for anything. But if he takes a, a $2 million contribution, then the, the primary interest of the person contributing to his campaign, he now has to recuse himself from that issue. Uh, a couple of examples are this. If a candidate takes a $1 million from Sheldon Adelson, he is no longer allowed to vote on anything that has to do with any type of gambling, Internet gambling or anything. And if he takes a $2 million contribution from Exxon Oil, he's now recused from voting for anything for or against the oil industry. There would be a list of each candidate and how many contributions they've taken over the $2,000 limit, and those issues would follow vote for or against these issues or introduce any bills on these issues. That would immediately eliminate the quid pro quo and immediately eliminate buying influence because you're not buying influence. These people say, I'm only contributing because I like the leanings of this candidate. Well, put your money where your mouth is. Give him $2 million and he's not allowed to vote on your issue. That would go a long way, full disclosure, and that would go a long way to eliminating a lot of these large contributions. Okay. That's my point on it. Thanks. All right, Rich. Lisa Rosenberg. Well, obviously, we agree with Rich um, on the full disclosure part. Um, and I guess what we would suggest is we, we leave it to the voters. You know, once they have the once they're armed with the information, um, the voters can determine whether there's a conflict of interest or not. Uh, and, and and hopefully that will help them make their decisions when they go to the polls. It's an interesting um, an interesting proposal to, uh, you know, to prevent some to prevent a member of Congress from voting on an interest when they took money on it. Um, it has a certain a certain appeal, you know. I think what we'd find is there would there would be a lot of 
um, oil and gas and financial industries um, that just wouldn't get, you know, financial industry issues that wouldn't get votes because, again, so many of these donations are concentrated in just a few industries. Uh, it, it, but it's, it's an, an interesting proposal. A lot of attention has been paid to the Koch brothers, particularly by the Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, Democrat of Nevada, who tweets frequently about the influence of the Koch brothers in elections, as well as coming to the floor and giving speeches about them. Today in the, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Charles Koch responds, I'm fighting to restore a free society. He writes this, rather than try to understand my vision for a free society or accurately report the facts about Koch Industries, our critics would have you believe we're un-American in trying to rig the system, that we're against environmental protection or eager to end workplace safety standards. He goes on to write, companies employ 60,000 Americans who make many thousands of products that Americans want and need. According to government figures, our employees in the 143,000 additional American jobs they support generate nearly $11.7 billion in compensation and benefits. About one-third of our U.S.-based employees are union members. He also writes this, Far from trying to rig the system, I have spent decades opposing cronyism in all political favors, including mandates, subsidies, and protective tariffs, even when we benefit from them. I believe that cronyism is nothing more than welfare for the rich and powerful and should be abolished. Coke Industries was the only major producer in the ethanol industry to argue for the demise of the ethanol tax credit in 2011. More in the Wall Street Journal if you want to read that. Let's go to Harold in East Alton, Illinois, Democratic caller. Hi, Harold. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, thanks, C-SPAN, for giving us a say-so in the matter. It seems like ordinary people get to call in. Don't always agree with their beliefs, but appreciate the chance to speak out. I, th I think that this is one of the most outrageous things that we have in politics right now. It, uh, it seems like we just we put way too much money in this, and the money is controlling all this. I ask myself, why is a congressman that makes $175,000 a year taking a job that only makes 175000 a year, but all of them are millionaires. Why would you take a cut in pay? There's plenty of people, Joe the plumber, I'd like to have Nelly the nurse, people that would like to make $175,000 a year and would actually show up every day and vote on the things that we need to vote on. And I think that the lobbyists have a big part in this. The lobbyist themselves is a bribe. It used to be you got so many signatures of constituents, and that's how you brought it to your congressman, and that's how he was supposed to vote according to his constituents, not because oil has sent him a big check, so he's going to vote that way no matter. The, the gun law is a good way to, you know, everybody wants to pass some kind of gun laws. We can't, pass, we can't even get the vote on the floor because those people are already paid off. Okay. All right, Harold. Another wealthy donor has made the headlines this morning in the papers. The Washington Times front page, George Soros turns cash into legalized pot. Billionaire George Soros donations and nonprofit groups help fund the organizations that promote movements to legalize marijuana. That in the Washington Times this morning. Richard Trumpka, the head of the AFL-CIO union, weighed in on Twitter on the SCOTUS's decision yesterday saying, we need fundamental reform. The average ordinary American should have as strong a voice as the Koch brothers do in politics. Lynn, North Providence, Rhode Island, independent caller. Hi, Lynn. Hi. I thank you for taking my call. I am very upset over Ms. Rosenberg's comment that there was no conspiracy with the IRS. Lois Lerner's emails prove that there is. And for you to allow her to make that comment and get away with it is absolutely wrong. Our um, Judge Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, made a big mistake calling Obamacare a tax when it wasn't even argued for that. What is happening with our country is a shame, and I am so scared for the future of our country. Our politics has become so corrupt that people have walked away from it. Our country is doomed if it can.
continues this way, and Ms. Rosenberg needs to be chastised publicly. Thank you. All right, well, let's give her a chance to respond. Lisa Rosenberg. Um, you know, there were multiple investigations, multiple congressional hearings into the IRS uh, uh, scandal. And as I said before, I believe the IRS went about investigating these nonprofit groups in, in an improper manner. They used shorthand. They used the names of the groups to decide whether or not they were going to investigate the groups. Um, and for that, what we need are new rules that apply to the IRS, new rules that apply to nonprofit organizations that try to engage in electioneering activities. Um, but again, you know, all of these hearings and all of these investigations, they certainly don't, um, you know, point any higher than Lois Lerner, um, you know, who was directing the investigations, no question about it. But, um, you know, to call it a conspiracy, I, I think is, is um, a little bit of an exaggeration, to say the least. But I do think we need new rules to apply to the IRS. There's no question um, that we need rules to make it clearer for the IRS and the people trying to engage in political discussion what is allowed and what isn't allowed. James Ard says, why do liberals so dislike political speech? And then another tweet from one of our viewers who says, incumbents of long standing more likely to be corrupt, dependent on staying in office. Mike, Richmond, Virginia, Republican caller. You're our last on this. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of things have been said here. I think when, you come, when you're talking about freedom of speech, I think it's important to realize that freedom of speech is absolute. Freedom of speech doesn't depend on whether or not one is exercising it on behalf of a corporation. Freedom of speech doesn't depend on how much money one has to exercise freedom of it's all about the right of an individual to express himself, especially when it comes to political speech. Uh, the, the people arguing against uh, big money having more uh, say, for example, than people who don't have a lot of money, what can you say? I mean, life is not fair. It's never going to be fair. The, uh, the right of freedom of speech is always exercised by individuals. And if you can crack down and uh, restrict the right of freedom of speech of some just because they have more money to express it than others do, then what you're saying is that the federal government has the power to restrict all political speech by all people. I'm sorry, you, you can't have it both ways. Okay. Freedom of speech is an absolute, fundamental, natural right of individuals, regardless of how it's expressed. Okay, Lisa Rosenberg. Freedom of speech is actually not an absolute right. Freedom of speech can be curtailed under the Constitution in certain cases. And, in fact, it can be curtailed to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. The Supreme Court um, has not changed that. Um, and my position is that the corruption or appearance of, of corruption is much more likely when we're talking about million-dollar contributions than we're talking when we're talking about $25 contributions. So, um, you know, just as the, the old phrase is you can't, you're not free to, to yell fire in a movie theater if there's no fire in the movie theater, freedom of speech can actually be curtailed uh, very carefully, very cautiously. And I think the laws before McCutcheon, which limited the amount of money that could go into the system by an individual, were appropriate, necessary, limited ways to um, prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption while still allowing people to give whatever they wanted to is, you know, or money to campaign, con uh, give campaign contributions to candidates. Lisa Rosenberg, the paper's reporting this morning that the Chief Justice left the door open in uh, his opinion, um, in, in the majority opinion, for Congress to act down the line to try to curtail corruption or the perception of it. Well, I mean, I, I think you know, asking this Congress to act on anything is, um, you know, is, is a pretty safe bet that nothing's going to change. Um, you know, we have a very, very hard time getting this Congress to move on any of these issues. Um, and again, you know, we certainly at the very, as, as a starting point, hope Congress, is, Congress acts um, to uh, ensure there's more disclosure of these contributions. And that would be a first step. There's no question about that. And we hope to see at least that. Um, but even that's going to be an uphill battle, even disclosure is an uphill battle with this Congress. So whatever the Chief Justice might have um, 
you know, might have suggested. I think he probably felt pretty confident nothing was going to, to happen. Um, plus, he defined corruption so narrowly um, that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's going to be problematic if anyone does try to legislate. Um, because, you know, he basically says, unless you can prove you're buying a vote, uh, there's no corruption. And that's just not the way Congress works. That's um, a very naive um, view of Washington. We'll leave it there for now. Lisa Rosenberg, government affairs consultant with the Sunlight Foundation. Thank you. Thank you.